Hey everyone, and welcome to the Outdoor Cannabis Cultivation Tutorial for Beginners. My name is Alex, and this lesson is in collaboration with Altadena Library District, so big shout out to them for the opportunity. This lesson is targeted towards beginners, mostly because, well, I'm still very much a beginner myself. But aside from that, I know that there's a lot of depth to this topic, and I know that it can be very, very intimidating to newcomers. This is meant to be as an introduction to the topic, and we'll go over the basics all the way from germination to harvest. Because this is mainly for beginners, I'm going to focus mainly on outdoor growing as opposed to indoor growing. Outdoor growing has a lower barrier to entry and is a great way to try out and see if you want to continue and stick to outdoor growing, make the move to indoor growing, or perhaps do both. So let's get started. Prop 64 dictates that you can grow six plants per household and that the growing area must be locked and not visible to the public. The six plants per household means that regardless of how many people you live with, it's still six plants. You can live with 10 people, 100 people, and still you're only allowed six plants, unfortunately. The area must be locked, as in it must be enclosed, typically like with a gate, and it cannot be visible to anyone kind of just walking by, like say from the sidewalk, cannot be visible from the public. Um, as always, you should consult your local city-specific regulations because they tend to vary quite drastically depending on what jurisdiction you're in. For more information, check out this website. All websites in this tutorial will be in the description. Next, we're going to go over some basic plant biology and an overview of the growing process so you know what to expect. As a cannabis plant grows, it goes through two sequential growth cycles. The picture on the left is the vegetative cycle, and that's when it grows upward and outward, and it grows all of those distinct fan leaves in order to maximize surface area for photosynthesis. Next is the flowering cycle, and that's the picture on the right. The flowering cycle is where it stops growing upward and outward and focuses its energy on growing the flowers or buds that contain the cannabinoids and terpenes that we're interested in. When does a plant go from vegetative to flowering? Well, that depends on the type of cannabis strain that it is. A cannabis plant can either be a photoperiod strain or an autoflower strain. A photoperiod strain means that the transition from vegetative to flowering is determined by the amount of light or darkness that the plant is exposed to. For most of these strains, when the hours of daylight exposure drops to below 14 to 15 hours, then it'll switch to flowering. That means that if you could manipulate the amount of light that a photoperiod strain is exposed to, you can dictate when, if ever, the plant starts flowering. And this is exactly what a lot of dispensaries do, a lot of growers, what they do in order to keep a mother plant vegetating indefinitely and then just taking clones from that mother plant to bring to maturity to grow and sell. If you were to grow indoors, you would be able to do this exact same thing by manipulating this light cycle. Autoflower strains have genetics that cause them to start flowering regardless of length of exposure to light. The exact time frame is strain dependent, but it's usually around a month or so. So which should you get? Well, it depends on when you intend to grow. If you're watching this in October in Southern California, then you know that the days are getting shorter, so you may want to go to autoflower. If you plan on growing, say, in the end of spring or the beginning of the summer months, you will have a very, very long period of time where there's a lot, a lot of daylight. So you may want to go a photo period in that case, because then you have a lot of time for the plant to get huge. So by the time it switches over to flowering, then you can get these monster, monster yields. If you're not sure, you don't want to do that calculus and you just want to get started without even wanting to think about light cycles or any of that stuff, then go with auto flower. When it comes to the starting point of your cannabis growth, you have a choice between clones and seeds. Clones are potted plants that are around three to four weeks old that you can buy from your dispensary if they carry them. They're always going to be photo period and female. The advantage of clones is that you already have some of the work done for you, like germination and the initial planting. All that you need to do is just transfer it into the final container and continue with the grow process all the way to maturity and then all the way to harvest. 
If you choose to start from seed, you have the option of buying photo period seeds or autoflower seeds. You can buy these online at any online seed bank and you can buy them feminized, which means that they're guaranteed to produce female plants. I mentioned previously that this tutorial is going to be mainly focused on outdoor growing, but I want to give you a quick overview of indoor growing in case that's something that you may be interested in. Indoor growing lets you have control over every single variable of your grow. That's a good thing to some people and a not so good thing to other people. There's fewer pests to worry about, which is awesome. However, there is the issue of the smell. If you live with others or you're trying to be discreet, then the smell management is another factor that you need to take into consideration. And also the equipment to grow indoors may not be a good fit for a lot of people's design aesthetics. Here we have some pictures of some example setups. The first image on the left is a classic grow tent. These come in all different types of sizes to fit whatever space that you have for them. And this particular grow tent does not have a carbon filter attached to it, which would be the smell management component of this grow. The image in the middle is a space bucket. Space buckets are a great DIY, like very, very low cost solution. And typically it involves like a five gallon bucket or one of those larger plastic trash can or some of those like Rubbermaid totes. They have a group of very, very devoted growers who love to do it this way. And there's like a huge subculture around it. And so if this speaks to the DIY maker ethos, then that may be of interest to you. The last image on the right are kind of these like hybrid stealth options that combine kind of like furniture and furniture making along with cannabis growing. And, you know, people repurpose old TV cabinets like this picture on the right. They can take Ikea closets, Ikea pieces of furniture and kind of upcycle them to grow cannabis in. Outdoor growing compared to indoor growing has a much lower barrier to entry. There's no electricity required and there's no expensive setup required like any of the equipment that we saw in the previous slide. However, you're ultimately at the mercy of mother nature and there's pests to deal with. How do we actually grow cannabis outdoors? The rest of this tutorial will go through each of the steps that your plant will go through. Step one, germination. That's when we get a seed to grow a tap root. Step two, the vegetative cycle. That's when it grows tall and wide, grows those distinct fan leaves for photosynthesis. Step three, the flowering cycle. That's when it grows the buds. Step four, harvest. That involves chopping the plant, trimming, drying. Last step, curing. That's when we mellow out the chlorophyll and all of those other grassy, gross tasting flavors from our buds. A few supplies that you should get in order before you start growing. Soil. That's going to be the most important thing that you're going to get. I can personally recommend Fox Farm Ocean Forest. That's the soil that I use every single grow. There's also Roots Organic, which I haven't personally used, but I hear that other people use it to great success. One word of advice, check out your local hydroponic store for this soil. It'll usually be cheaper than what you can get online, like places like Amazon, places like that. So check with them. You can typically get a pretty good deal. You'll want some perlite. And that's just for aeration of the soil so that it doesn't become too dense and that there's room for your roots to get oxygen and for water to you know flow. You want to get some five gallon or bigger fabric pots. So fabric pots allow the roots of your plant to get oxygen and it will prevent it from becoming root bound. And that's a condition where the roots become starved of oxygen and will continue growing within the container. It'll just keep growing, displacing the soil and eventually starving itself from nutrients. So these fabric pots, because of their permeability, allow the roots to get oxygen from the outside. And via a process called air pruning, it prevents the roots from growing longer indefinitely and becoming root bound. A five gallon pot will be adequate for most people. 
The only exception is if you're going to be growing a photo period strain at the end of spring or the beginning of summer. If so, you want to consider going up to 7 gallon or 10 gallon pots just because of the duration of the vegetative cycle that your plant is going to go through. But even if all those things considered, you go with a 5 gallon, you'll be fine. Also, if you can, get some handles for them just to make it easier for you to carry them around. You're also going to want to get mason jars for curing. And if you don't want to get the 50, 100 pack that they sell at the supermarket, you can get individual ones from Michael's, the craft store. The optional things that I suggest but are recommended, some twisty ties, safety pins or binder clips. That's going to be used for some plant training, which I'll go over later. And lastly, a jeweler's loop or a handheld microscope. That's going to be used for examining your plant's trichomes in order to determine whether or not it's ready for harvest. That's optional, but as, you see, as you'll see later on, it'll be a huge help. Now that we've got our supplies in place, we're ready to start germinating. This step is only if you're starting with seeds. If you're starting with clones, then obviously skip this section. There's a lot of different germination methods, but for the sake of simplicity, we're going to stick with my personal favorite, which is the paper towel germination method. There's also a shot glass germination method that's super popular as well, but I still prefer paper towel germination. What we're essentially doing is we're taking our seeds and we're simulating a warm, moist, and dark environment. You could just plant them in the ground and wait until they start growing. However, the reason why we're germinating not in soil is it helps us determine which seeds are viable before planting. Because if you have a selection of seeds, say you've got, a, you know, I don't know, 10 seeds, it's possible that one or more of them may be bad because they're too old or maybe it got damaged or whatever. And so it's a good way to determine which seeds are good to go so that we don't have to put them all into soil and then wait, you know, say like one week, two weeks before we actually see them sprout from the dirt in order for us to make the determination on which ones are viable and which ones are not. To do the paper towel method, wet two paper towels, wring out the excess water and put them on a plate. Take your seeds and then put them on top of that paper towel. And then if you have seeds from different strains, then label them with a marker. And that's that first image on the left-hand side. Next, you're going to take another paper towel, wet it, wring out the excess water, and then put it on top of everything. That's that picture in the middle. And then lastly, take another plate and put it on top. That's that image on the right. We're simulating that warm, moist, dark environment artificially with these paper towels and plates. You're going to want to check on your seeds at least once a day, making sure that the towel stays moist but not wet. What you're looking for is you're looking for the tap root. And so the tap root is, you can see it in the picture here, these little squiggly, squiggly lines coming from the seed. Once that emerges, then they're ready to be transplanted into soil. It typically takes around one to three days for young seeds and longer for older seeds. Once that taproot is out, it's ready to be placed into soil. If it's a photo period strain, put that seed into a small container and then when that plant is around six inches or tall, transfer it into its larger container. The picture on the right is an example of a small container that you can use and when you should start considering moving it to a larger container. If your seed is an autoflower strain, then you're going to take that seed and put it directly into its final container, its final large container, whether it be your 5-gallon fabric pot or 7-gallon or, or whatever. During the vegetative cycle, water the plant when the top inch of soil is dry. If you have a fabric pot, like I suggested you get, it's very difficult to overwater because the excess will drain out. However, you want to try to avoid that as much as possible because if the water does drain out, it also carries nutrients with it, leaving less nutrients for the plant. Depending on how hot your climate is, you'll net out maybe watering every one or two days or so, but ultimately you should be checking on the soil and seeing if it's dry and watering appropriately. Most autoflower strains, the vegetative cycle is going to be like four to seven weeks. For photo period strains, it depends on what time of year you've decided to plant. When your plant is a few weeks old, it's going to be time to consider 
Low Stress Training, or LST. This is an optional step, but I highly recommend it. It's also very, very easy, and the risk to your plants is, is relatively low. Low stress training is a method to maximize the surface area of your plant that's exposed to sunlight in order to increase its yield. The left hand photo is a photo of a cannabis plant that hasn't been modified at all. It just kind of grows naturally. So the natural growth causes it to grow kind of like in this Christmas tree shape. And you'll notice that this Christmas tree shape, what happens is that the top of the plant gets the most sun. However, Everything that's underneath it is kind of underneath a canopy of shade. So while the plants and the, the, the leaves, the junctures below that top layer are exposed to sunlight, it's not nearly as much as the uppermost layer. LST is a method that takes what it looks like on the left hand side and makes it look more like the photo on the right hand side. The right hand side is kind of more bush like and less Christmas tree like. Here are some better pictures of the LST process. This picture on the left hand side, you can see that these, these blue things are wires that are pulling down on the main trunk of the plant. And so you can see that the main trunk is kind of curving like this to the kind of making a perpendicular or parallel to the ground instead of growing straight up. And so as a result, you can see these golden color branches, they're all exposed to the same amount of light as the topmost topmost area right here. The picture on the right is another another angle. So you can see that in step one, it's growing straight up like this. Step two, you're gonna be using these, these ties to pull the trunk down. And as the plant continues growing taller and taller and taller, the trunk what you're doing to the trunk is you're pulling it into a spiral shape. And this spiral shape is allowing the trunk to, like in this picture on the left hand side, it's allowing that trunk to be parallel to the ground so that everything that grows from the trunk is exposed to the same amount of light. Here are some pictures of LST on some of my plants. You can see in the left picture here, those binder clips that I mentioned along with those twisty ties. That's what I use to pull that trunk down and parallel to the, to the ground. And this plant right here is the same plant that's right here. I did LST on this plant here, this plant here, and this plant here. And you can kind of see that they're, they have that more squat bush-like appearance. Whereas this plant in the back, I did not do LST and it's taller and it's more of that like Christmas tree shape. In addition to low stress training, there's also high stress training, HST. And these are a group of advanced techniques that I don't really recommend for beginners, but feel free to look into them and see if you want to incorporate them. They include things like topping, thimming, and super cropping. After a few weeks, you'll begin to see pre-flowers, which will help you determine the sex of your plant. If you bought feminized seeds or you bought a clone from a dispensary, then you don't need to worry about that since it will be guaranteed to be female. But if you're planting seeds that you got from some unknown source or from a bag of seeds, then this is when you're going to make that determination on whether you should keep it or throw it out. So male plants, you typically want to throw out because they will pollinate any other female plants and turn them into males. And because male plants don't have THC, most people will just get rid of them. You may want to keep them if you decide to crossbreed and produce your own hybrids, but that's kind of like an advanced thing, and chances are you won't be doing that. So if they're male, toss them out. If they're female, then you know continue with the process. And how you determine whether or not they're male or female is you look at these pre-flowers here. The picture on the left is a female plant. And those pre-flowers are these kind of like thin little hairs, thin pistils. Whereas on the right hand side, you can see in a male plant, those instead of pistils, you see these like pollen sacs. As soon as you see these pollen sacs, you want to make sure that you don't accidentally pop them because they will send pollen everywhere and they will turn all of your female plants into male plants.
what I suggest you do is you get male plants as far away from po as possible from your female plants before you chop them and get rid of them. Shortly after the pre-flowers make an appearance, your plant's going to enter the flowering cycle. This generally lasts six to nine weeks and is, of course, strain dependent. When it comes to the watering requirements, it's going to be the same as vegetative. However, it's going to require more water because the plant is using much more energy than before in order to grow those, those buds. So you're going to be, want to be diligent in monitoring that soil and make sure it doesn't get too dry. Also, right now is when it's going to start smelling like a distinct cannabis smell. And so as a result, pests are going to start to be an issue at this time. Every time you water your plant, you're going to want to examine it and look for evidence of pests. There's a lot of different pests that can invade your plant. If it's not a praying mantis and if it's not a ladybug, chances are you want to get rid of it. So for me, when I grow, caterpillars are the most common pest. You can identify caterpillars by its droppings, which look like these mini hand grenades. Or if you look at your leaves, there's going to be chunks that are, that are taken out of it. These caterpillars, you want to get rid of them as soon as possible. Um, they're going to be green, so it's going to be tough to, to see. But if you look closely, you can see them and you can pick them out and you can get rid of them. One option, if you're okay with using pesticides, is this thing called Monterey BT. It's a solution that you kind of water down and you kind of spray on your plants. It's, from what I can tell, pretty safe, pretty non-toxic if you use it in amounts that are, you know, just for the home grower. When it comes time to harvest, you're looking for that Goldilocks zone. If you harvest it too soon, then your cannabis isn't going to be potent enough. If you harvest it too late, it's going to potentially be too strong, too narcotic, and too strong tasting. Those things may be to your liking, so it's important to know when to harvest in order to get the effects that you're looking for. There are two main methods to determine whether your plant is ready for harvest. The first method is the hairs method, which is an approximate method and involves looking at the hairs that surround your buds and waiting for about 75%ish of them to turn brown and curl inward. When that happens, you can go ahead and harvest your plant. The second method is the trichomes method, which is more precise, and it's my preferred method. The trichomes are the glass-like crystal structures that contain the cannabinoids of the plant. They go from clear to cloudy to amber, and you want to harvest your plant when the trichomes are mostly cloudy with about 10% amber. If you wait too long and a majority of them are that amber color, then that's when you're going to get that really like lethargic couch lock kind of feeling. The trichomes are very, very small. And so that's when you're going to use the jeweler's loop or a microscope in order to examine, examine them. So here's an example of the hairs method. These pictures are pictures of buds. And so these, the hairs that I'm referring to are these thin, wispy uh, things coming out of the, the buds themselves. Quick side note, the trichomes that I was referring to in the previous slide, there are these little dotted things coming out of the buds right here. So as you can tell, they're super small, and that's why you're going to need special equipment to see them closely. But the hairs, easily detectable with the naked eye, and so that's why a lot of people who don't want to invest money into specialized equipment, they just go by the hairs method. So in this first picture, probably too soon to harvest, and it's because the hairs are still light colored and not really darkened at all. The second picture, most of the hairs are starting to darken and starting to curl inwards here. So in the second picture, probably a good time to harvest. This last picture, almost all of the hairs have become brown and this is probably a little bit too late to harvest. So you can still harvest it and you, you for sure should. It's just that you're going to get more of that lethargic feel. Trichomes method. Trichomes start clear and glass-like, and then they become cloudy, and then they become amber. In this first picture, all of the trichomes are clear and glass-like, so probably too early to harvest. 
This next picture, most of them are cloudy with uh, a few of them amber kind of up here. So this picture is kind of the perfect time to harvest this plant. This last picture, most of the trichomes have become amber and at this stage it's probably too late and you should still harvest it but it'll give you more of those lethargic effects as opposed to kind of the you know the more balanced feel that the plant in this stage would give you when you've made the decision to harvest the overall process involves the following steps first step is the chop the chop is where you're going to chop down the branches dispose of the soil dispose of the trunk the next step is the wash this step is optional, but I personally highly recommend this step. Next is the trim. We're going to remove the leaves, and those leaves don't contain very many cannabinoids, so we're just going to trim them, and we're going to either get rid of them or use them for other purposes. The dry. We're going to take those trimmed buds, and we're going to hang them and dry them. Last step is the cure, and this last step is to mellow out any of those chlorophyll and other unpleasant flavors. When it comes to chopping down your plant, you can pretty much chop however you want, but ideally you want to chop it in such a way that it'll facilitate the subsequent steps of washing, trimming, and drying. For example, in this picture here, if you chop it at this red line, it doesn't really make your life much easier because you still everything is still connected to each other. So instead, I recommend that you chop at further up the plant at, for example, any of these blue lines here. Once you chop, you can get rid of the soil, compost it, whatever you want. Same with the rest of the, the trunk and the rest of the stems. This image is not flowering yet, and I'm just using it as a reference because you can get a really good view of the branch structure. After you chopped your plant, you're gonna to wanna to consider washing it. Like I mentioned earlier, this step is purely optional, but if you decide to do it, the bugs that you're gonna see in the liquid it's going to make you a believer. So essentially how this step works is there's going to you're going to have three containers here. The first container is just a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and water. The second container is lemon juice and baking soda and water. And the last one is just water to rinse. So you're going to take your your chopped stems. So again, you can see here you want to chop them in such a way that you can easily handle them. So you're going to take them and you're going to plunge them into each container and you're gonna give it a light swish between moving on to the next one. And then eventually you're gonna rinse it in the last container, which is just pure water. And then you're gonna give it a shake and then you're gonna place them aside here. You can put them in a separate plastic bin or a sheet pan or you know whatever you want. The trichomes on the plant, they are not water soluble. So as long as you're not violently banging your plant against the sides of the container, they will stay intact. This picture shows these rectangular bins, but you could also use five gallon buckets. The next step is trimming. The purpose of trimming is to get rid of the fan leaves that have low THC content and don't really taste very good. If you plan to use your cannabis for edibles only and you don't really mind the, that, flav that grassy flavor, then you can skip this step. If you do go through with trimming, these fan leaves that you trim off, they can be used to make ed edibles or pureed into smoothies. This photo here on the right shows a non-trimmed stalk on the left and a trimmed stalk on the right. This is of course after they've been dried, but in any case, you can see the difference between the two. Some people find the trimmed appearance much more attractive, and so that's another reason why you may or may not want to trim. If you trim at this particular point in time, right after chopping, you would be doing what's called a wet trim. If you were to instead proceed to the next step of drying and then trimming, you'd be doing what's called a dry trim. There are pros and cons to both, but for your first grow, I recommend that you do a wet trim, which is trimming right now after chopping. The actual trimming process involves removing those fan leaves. You can start by removing the big ones by hand and then switch to scissors for final work. Gloves are optional, but I recommend them. This is easily the most time consuming part. So if you can get comfortable and enlist some helpers. The first time I did it, I had three plants to trim and it took me three hours. One of the recommended tools are 
these bonsai scissors. You can get them at any bonsai grower, nursery, or you can get them on Amazon. And this picture on the left is untrimmed, and the picture on the right is trimmed. All right, next step, drying. We're almost there, guys. To dry your buds, you're going to want to hang them upside down in a dark, moderate humidity room. A garage or a closet, for example, works very well for this. The picture on the right is how I did it my first few times. I used a moving box, and then I stuck some wire hangers, and I, I think I used some butcher twine through the top. And then I used that as a way to just hang all of my trimmed buds. Now, you can see how I trim them in such a way that they're able to hang onto these strings and wire. Another option is the picture on the left, which is a, a thing for hanging clothes. But the clothes pins make it super convenient to like clip onto your branches. You can hang this directly in a closet or you can use my cardboard box contraption and then just clip it onto, you know, any one of those uh, pieces of wire or, or string. There's tons of guides online as well that go into lots of detail on measuring like the humidity of the room and adjusting up and down in order for the optimal dry time. But the general rule is that you know that it's done drying when the small stems of the buds are brittle and snap. And you want it to take about three to seven days. Anything shorter than that, you have dried it way too quickly. And anything longer than that, it is too humid of an environment. But for your first grow, I wouldn't stress too much about it. Just the fact that you've gotten to this point already is, is a huge, huge accomplishment. All right, the very last step, curing. Curing your buds gets rid of any residual chlorophyll or grassy flavors that will make smoking harsh and unpleasant. To cure your dried buds, trim the buds from the main stalks, place them in the mason jars, and let them hang out. You want to open the jars once a day to prevent any potential mold. And I'd say one month is the minimum amount of time you want to cure, and three months the recommended time. Again, tons of guides online if you want to geek the F out and use humidity packs and precisely monitor every single variable. If you choose to go that route, at the minimum, you're going to want a hygrometer, which is this device here in the picture on the left-hand side. It's a device that lets you monitor temperature and humidity, and you throw it directly into those jars, and you just kind of take a look at it every day and adjust as needed. Lastly, here are some resources that were super helpful to me when I was first starting out. The first two, growweedeasy.com and ilovegrowingmarijuana.com very in-depth details about every single thing that I went over today. If you want more detail on any particular step, you need more detail, say, on how to do LST, and maybe you're thinking about doing some HST, tons of info on, on those websites. The two subreddits, Outdoor Growing and Micro Growery, also very helpful. They get a lot of beginners in there asking a bunch of questions. Feel free to submit your own. Everyone's super friendly, and it's just a huge wealth of information. Weedinapot.com. It's a some guy in Canada. Anyway, his his stuff is also really good. He produces a lot of videos on on this topic, and he's actually the one that I got the idea of washing cannabis plants from. And the last one is the Calprop sixty four website on Ballotpedia.org. Check that out. All of these links will be in the description. If you made it this far, thank you for your time and good luck with your grows.